Yeah, right. Okay, that's good. They they will be joining joining during the lecture. Oh yeah, good. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so Eric, uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for being here. Uh, we are very pleased to have you here and have the opportunity to share with our Colombian students your experiences in your academic and research training. So um, I will uh, explain you, first of all, what is Cathedral Nomada about? Mm -hmm. So Cathedral Nomada is a project that integrates six different universities from Medellin, Colombia. Uh, it is a, a space where the knowledge of experts on various topics are shared and each semester we have a different topic. Um, uh, so that that's Cateranova. So after yes. that I I will present you. So uh, the lecturer, uh, lecturer of today is called Eric Barensen. He's an academic and researcher with a PhD in mathematics and computer science. He currently holds two full professorships, one in science education at Radboud University in Nijmegen, the Netherlands, and another in computing education at the Open University of the Netherlands. Throughout his academic career, Varensen has worked to advance teaching and learning in computer science and STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics subjects. His research focuses on topics such as computational thinking, the integration of digital technology into the curriculum, and scientific and digital literacy. He has also studied teachers' practical knowledge on how to improve teacher education and enhance a student learning outcomes. So Eric, welcome again. Thank you. And, uh, the presentation is yours. Thanks very much for this nice introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here uh, from Europe uh, uh, in, in your project. So I will share my screen and um, start my presentation. Seems to work. So I'm um, I will focus on on teaching and learning in computer science, and programming and using the computer will be a central point in my uh, in my lecture. Um, so this is the this is the uh, table of contents. So I will briefly introduce myself as well. Then we will talk about two subjects, computational thinking and programming, and then study how these things change in uh, times of uh, using artificial intelligence. So that is a new challenge in uh, in my field, and I'm very happy to uh, to talk about these uh, uh, challenging uh, times. And then I end with an outlook, so future plans. Um, so let me start with a, um, a personal introduction. Um, so, yeah. So my name is Erik Barentsen. I'm from Europe, from the Netherlands. And in this, uh, in this uh, uh, map, you see Europe. And the Netherlands is a very small country in the northwest of, of Europe. And Nijmegen is a, a city in the, at the border with Germany. So in the east part of the Netherlands. Well, the Netherlands is quite small. Uh, you can reach, uh, from my uh, city, you can reach Amsterdam, the capital, in a bit more than one hour. So it's a very small country. Um, Nijmegen is the oldest city in the Netherlands, and its history dates back to Roman times. The Romans were, were there uh, founding the city and you still see some very nice old remains in uh, in the city center. Um, in fact, I'm not in Nijmegen now. I'm doing this conference, uh, uh, this this lecture from Lithuania. I'm in Vilnius now, 
Um, and that is because I am joining a conference here and giving a, a, a keynote lecture on Friday. So I will, I'm a guest here and I'm doing this lecture from my hotel room. But very pleased to be here and uh, show you something about my background and uh, my, uh, my research. So Nijmegen uh, is the oldest city in the Netherlands. It's very nicely situated at the river, uh, the river Waal, and the campus of my university, Radboud University, is very green. And uh, if you look at that picture, and in the back of the picture, you will see uh, parts of Germany. So it's really close to the border. Um, there are many faculties. It's a general facul uh, a general university, and there are many faculties, a faculty of science, my faculty, but also a faculty of law, faculty of arts, medicine, and management. So it's a very general university. So my faculty is the faculty of science, a very modern building you see here with some nice facilities. We have a, uh, for instance, a nanotechnology lab and one of the strongest magnet labs in uh, in the world. So it's a very pleasant environment to uh, to work. Um, science faculty hosts many subjects, or so there's physics, mathematics, chemistry, biology, computer science, and also my institute, the Institute of Science Education, connecting all these all these fields. Um, a bit more about myself. So I'm a professor of science education. So I study teaching and learning in science. And I am especially a professor of computer science education. So focusing on my original field, computer science at Open University. And in practice, I do both from the same city, uh, Nijmegen. I made a bit of a development because my thesis, my PhD thesis was about theoretical computer science. And you see a random page of my thesis uh, in this left picture. It was very formal, very mathematical, very theoretical. And gradually I shifted towards studying how people learn these things. So now I do research, not with all these theoretical things, uh, but I do research with people, with students and with teachers. But still, it's nice to connect the two because knowing how learning works also uh, uh, um, uh, also requires that you know how science works. So I think this is a nice opportunity to connect both of my fields. Um, so for science, we also read STEM sometimes. So STEM uh, stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So I'm a researcher and a scientist, and I like to travel a lot. And I have some nice pictures. Uh, so um, occasionally, uh, I find myself in the north of Europe, so right now in Lithuania, and sometimes in Finland. And uh, I have some nice picture here. Um, in the snow, in winter, in Finland, with some of my colleagues. And um, you will see it's a very nice landscape and uh, it's very spectacular, all this snow. Um, and, and you see myself and some colleagues there. You will notice that I am the one with the, with the hat, uh, the only one who is not laughing, who is not, not smiling. But the others are apparently having some fun. And it is because in fact, I prefer warmer weather. I don't like cold weather that much. I enjoy the snow there, but I, uh, I prefer warmer weather. And I had the privilege, and it's nice to show in this in this audience, I had the privilege to visit Colombia uh, last year and enjoy a bit warmer weather here in Cartagena and also in uh, uh, on San Andres. And, and you see that uh, it made me smile um, uh, eventually. So um, I enjoyed it very much and I'm very happy to do something in return and do this lecture. I would like to know a bit more about you. So can you please put in the chat a bit about your subject? So you're all engineering students, I know, but what are your subjects? So can you please put 
something about your own studies in the chat. And I will have a look. So what type of engineering do you study? Eric, they are from electrical, mechanical, computer science, engineering, yeah. and some others. Ah, OK. And I see that the chat is not working, so OK, that's good to know. Uh, let's see. Yeah. OK, my first topic is computational thinking. Uh, and computational thinking means uh, uh, using, making use of digital technology. And um, computational thinking is part of what we call digital literacy. So the skills that you need to make use of, of computers. And we distinguish a, a few skills, basic skills, so knowing how to operate a computer, information skills, so dealing with information on the internet, for instance, conflicting information, using media. And the final subskill is computational thinking. And computational thinking is maybe the most involved skill in digital literacy. It means that you can apply digital technology and computers in any field, in your own field, in your engineering field, uh, but also maybe in daily life. And um, it is, in fact, a bit of computer science in a context. And you see some examples here. So on the left, you see a simulation in biology, uh, spreadsheets, uh, obvious examples. Uh, some people use programming uh, to solve problems with the computer. And the, uh, the, 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 the rightmost example is a very nice one. We use that in, uh, in uh, humanities, in history classes, for instance using a Google tool, engrams, to show the development, historical development of, of, of terms. So all digital devices, sometimes we program, but not always digital devices to help you ahead in, in any field. Computational thinking is not new. It originates in the 1980s, where Seymour Peppert, uh, the researcher thought, well, if we teach children how to do programming, they will uh, they will uh, be better programs uh, problem solvers later on. So they will be able to solve any problems using using programming. So he taught uh, students, young children mostly, how to program. And he used a nice, uh, a nice programming language, Logo, to teach these children how to program. And uh, Logo was a kind of graphical thing. You could draw pictures uh, with, uh, with a kind of robot. So uh, students used to program and, and uh, learn gradually how to use this programming language. So his ideal was teach young children how to program and they will solve any problem later. Well, that turned out to be a bit of a failure because it didn't work. And we will show, uh, we will see why later on. But more than 25 years later, Janet Wing, a, an educator, said that we should introduce, reintroduce this computational thinking invented by Peppert because it is a fundamental skill for all subjects, not only for computer science, to use to be able to use the computer in, in daily life and in all those fields. And she said, we have to invest. Well, maybe Peppert's way of working didn't work, but we have to invest in teaching all young people to use uh, the computer. Well, if you have a look at definitions of computational thinking, then you run, run into this kind of lists uh, of abstract terms like abstraction and decomposition and evaluation, generalization, and some algorithmic thinking. Well, you can imagine it has to do something, but it's a very mysterious, it's a very vague definition. So 
when I explain people what computational thinking is, then I use this diagram. So the top half is a context that can be physics or engineering or uh, uh, humanities, uh, but also your daily life. And the bottom part is computer science. There are things uh, like algorithms, like data, like processes. And what you do when you, uh, when you apply computational thinking, you translate a challenge in your context, in your daily life or in your subject uh, to computational elements so that the computer can, can do something with it means algorithms, data, information, whatever. And then you use programming or some other tool to find a solution. And you translate the solution back into your context and you check whether it really solves the problem. Um, so there are four skills that you have to master. And now you can also see why Pepper's program didn't work because he only concentrated on the bottom half of this of this thing. So this one computationalized arrow. So if you teach people how to program, they will not automatically be able to do the vertical arrow. So to connect this programming with the context they're working on. So you have to teach computational thinking, you have to teach programming in a context, so in engineering, in chemistry, in biology, or whatever. So, um, well, this is something I work on. So how to connect computer science things with any subject. And it can be different forms. You can use existing digital tools. So some people are a bit afraid of programming. So you can do it also without programming, using existing tools. But you can use programming. And so another occurrence of computational thinking is using models that we borrow from computer science. So here are a few examples. So simulating uh, disease transmission. This is a, uh, 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 the leftmost picture is, uh, is a simulation tool. Uh, on the right, there is a climate investigation tool so children can students can experiment with different climate factors to understand climate change and in the uh, in the middle you see a simulation of a wave uh, that can be used to understand physics so all require that you translate that you connect some context physics healthcare climate to computer science and then use that to solve the problem. There's also another way of using computer science is that and this modeling. And you see some biological models, for instance, for uh, resistance of antibiotics, but also some biological processes there that you see um, uh, that can be modeled using computer science. And on the right hand side, you see a very interesting, uh, a very interesting uh, application. When I studied grammar in school, we had to analyze sentences and then determine all the words and it was very boring. So this is a way of studying grammar or teaching grammar by generating sentences. So this is a, a computer science model of language and you can follow the arrows uh, uh, starting from the left hand side and then you you get a sentence you get for instance the big pirates sang and the old dog laughed so you can experiment with grammar and children can can play with the arrows and maybe add something or change something and then see whether whether this is still correct so it's another way, uh, more uh, more active way of learning learning grammar by using computational thinking, by using models that stem from com computer science. Well, I believe that this is the way that uh, also to teach students and uh, to teach young children how to use the computer. So connected to any field that they are interested in. But there can be different levels of this computational things, these applications, these connections, 
of computer science to a specific field. And I have a picture here showing these different levels. That is a model you, uh, originally for technology integration, and it starts at the bottom, at, uh, at the bottom, this substitution augmentation that says, well, you can, uh, you apply computers by just replacing things you already did by the computer. For instance, you replace calculations by, uh, by hand, uh, by uh, calculations using the computer. And that's just substitution. You replace something you already could do with uh, something in the computer. The more you get up in this model, this A, M and R, the more innovations you get. And the final level is redefinition. Uh, that is the level in which using the computer makes things possible that were absolutely impossible before. So it gives rise to new tasks, new things which, that you can do using the computer. And you can imagine that uh, uh, when, when the schools start to implement this computational thinking, that they start at the bottom and they have to really discover how to make use of the computer at the fullest. At the, fullest. Uh, the rightmost picture is also the, depicting this summer model. It's a bit of a weird uh, uh, um, picturization using submarines and water. Um, don't quite understand why this is, but the, the idea is the, the deeper you get, the more involved, uh, uh, the more sophisticated, the more innovative uh, the use of computers is. Well, I have an example here showing that deep uh, use of the computer, and it's an example taken from astrophysics. Uh, in this picture, you see uh, that was the, this picture was uh, uh, published last year. It is a picture of a black hole. It is a picture of the black hole in the center of our galaxy in the Milky Way, and it was a breakthrough because now we have actual data, actual images that, uh, that show us this, uh, this phenomenon, this black hole. Um, to understand how black holes work, uh, astrophysicists use models and simulations. And I have an example here of such a simulation. And you see it's quite spectacular. Um, this, uh, such a black hole spins and uh, 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 plasma materials around it are moving. And these, uh, these things you can observe uh, because they irradiate, they, they, they emit radiation that you can observe. So this is a simulation of such radiation, such movement of, these, of this material in different frequencies. So there are four frequencies, that's why there are four images. And you can see the dynamics of these of these movements and the intensity of the radiation. These are simulations, and astrophysicists use them to understand what is going on in this in this black hole. Uh, it's very exciting, and this is clearly something that we couldn't do before, because this requires a lot of computation power and a lot of data. And you can see in the diagram why this is computational thinking, because you have to translate the challenge. How does it work into things you can run in a simulation on the computer? So you have to know how physics works. And this is in the context of general relativity. You have to understand the physics. You have to model the physics into something that the, comp that the computer can do. Then you have to program. So the downmost arrow uh, you have to program something, uh, this, this uh, um, simulation, in a very good way, because it takes a lot of computer time. This takes days to compute. So the cleverer your program, the faster you get. Then you translate it back to see whether your, uh, your simulation makes sense and uh, um, corresponds to the physical reality, because we also have uh, observations. And then these astrophysicists, they compare the, the simulations with the, uh, the real data and they, uh, they check whether they have understood 
this uh, this phenomenon and they go back to the challenge. Uh, so that's the fourth arrow uh, uh, to adjust their models and then run the simulation again. So this work requires a lot of computation power, and this is really only you uh, only uh, uh, possible using very sophisticated, very powerful computers and a lot of data. So you have to be very cle clever, not only in programming, but also in managing the data and the managing that data is really huge. And I have a picture here of uh, uh, these are not gigabytes, uh, but 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 multiple giga gigabytes, terabytes and petabytes of data. And the interesting thing is that the Internet is not not big enough to transport all this data. It should take too much time. So this data is physically transported uh, on on planes on uh, 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 by human beings. So it's a lot of data and a lot of computational power, a very nice example of computational thinking in physics. So what do we do in our institute? Um, well, not those uh, uh, heavy astrophysics examples, but we uh, uh, we study how this computational thinking can be integrated in all kinds of subjects. And we uh, do pro uh, uh, projects together with schools, with universities and with teachers to study how this can be done, this integration of computers with all kinds of subjects and how to teach this to beginning students. And it's, I like that a lot. And it's a very nice combination, as I said, between uh, STEM subjects, so uh, sophisticated, very advanced science, but also uh, studying, teaching and learning. So how people deal with these uh, these things. So um, my next uh, topic will be uh, a bit zooming in. So we know what computational thinking is, and I want to zoom in a bit on programming because programming is often used in computational thinking. So let's switch to the next uh, uh, topic. Well, uh, uh, I know that that many of you have some experience in, in programming and uh, maybe you will agree with me that programming is difficult. It's a difficult thing to learn. Uh, it takes a lot of time and it's, it's, it can be challenging. And um, I'm involved in research about programming and learning how to program. And uh, the idea that it is difficult is confirmed. Lots of research has been done on uh, how difficult it is and what the difficulties are. And a very famous problem is uh, uh, this problem, a very simple programming exercise called the rainfall pro uh, problem. And it is the, uh, uh, the, the task, suppose you get a list uh, of uh, of numbers and the idea is that they uh, indicate rainfall and um, in the end of this list of programs you get uh, this huge value 99999 and um, when you receive that you calculate the average of the numbers so far but this seems like a very basic programming exercise but if you do that if you uh, investigate what students do, they make a lot of mistakes and um, only a minority, a small minority of students uh, complete this exercise without any any error and without any mistake. So that suggests that, that so programming is really difficult. And so we try to understand what happens. Um, and also programming teachers, they struggle with this. So they say, well, my students have no clue. Uh, so they don't understand what they are doing. Uh, and uh, especially they complain about students not thinking. So um, they say, well, when you present them with an, an, with an assignment, with, an, uh, with a challenge, they immediately st uh, 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 um, uh, uh, take the computer and start typing. Uh, before even thinking. 
but we don't we didn't really understand what was going on in the minds of of beginning programmers so teachers were really struggling so recent research there has been a lot of research on what happens in the minds of students and we know a bit more now we know a lot more about how students develop this uh, this programming uh, uh, skills and i want to share something with you uh, uh, about this recent development and um, uh, this is work by two australian researchers raymond lister and donna teague who studied what exactly is required of, of, of beginning programmers and why they struggle with writing correct programs. And I have a few exercises here and let me let me just present it with you uh, 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 to you just to to have an idea. So this is one particular exercise and I would like to ask you to solve this. So this is a small program and it doesn't matter in which programming language. And the I, could you just look at this and determine what is the value of X after running this program? And what is the value of Y and what is the value of Z? And it would be nice if you type something in in the chat if you know the correct answer. Is there any? So please type something in the chat if you know the answer. Yeah, thanks. This is the first answer there. Very nice. I need access five. Yeah, and indeed everything is five. Very nice. Thank you for sharing. Great. Yes, so congratulations. <laughs> you passed this first test. That means that you can trace code, and this is a basic skill, it turns out. So I have another exercise. This one. And it's a program, and I left out some details. So you can assume that uh, uh, so there are three variables, y1, y2, and y3. And um, uh, in the in the squares, there is a code to swap, so to exchange the values of two variables. And people who know how to program, they will realize, oh, you need an extra variable to store this uh, intermediate variable. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, you can assume that there is correct code there to uh, swap these values. So can you look at this code and try to uh, discover what it does. So what is the purpose of this code? What does it do? And please write your answers in the chat. So what does this code do? I see the order the values. Yeah. Can you be a bit more specific in which order? Maria, thanks.
So it's some kind of ordering, right? Yeah, ordering, is it from big to small or from small to big? Oh, sorry, from uh, small to big or from big to small? Yeah, that's completely correct, Maria. Thank you. Um, so if you look closely, you see that it sorts the values from small, uh, some from big to small. Yes. So you, if you know how to do this, then you, then you know how to explain code, explain the purpose of code. Now, what these two researchers, Australian researchers, discovered that uh, in order to write things, write programs, you have to know how to trace and explain code. So these two things you have to know before you can program, you, before you can write programs. And there's a very strong correlation, it's a very, very impressive result. And now we know how people how people uh, uh, develop and we can, we can help students develop because we have to uh, uh, give attention to tracing and to explaining. And this was all hidden in the past. So what they did is to, uh, we, they made a kind of model about development stages of, uh, of, of students. So the first stage is that you're uh, not able to trace. The second is that you're able to trace, but not uh, um, um, uh, to reason about code. And this, the last stage is that you're able to reason about the code by looking at the code. And this is a, a variant of uh, um, uh, things that uh, are connected with Jean Piaget. Jean Piaget is, an, uh, is a psychologist and he characterized development of children in, in exactly the same way. And these Australians uh, connected these to programming. So it is very interesting to see the difference between this uh, first, uh, the sorry, the second and the third stage. So suppose you can trace, but you cannot reason about code. What happens then? And I have an example here. This is uh, the same exercise that we uh, uh, that we did here, and this is a, a recording of a student solving that exercise. And um, the what the student did is to is take a few example values. So one, two, and three for y1, y, y2, and y3. And then he traced what happened. And he concluded that y1 is three in the end, y2, two, and y3 is one. So what is his conclusion? He said the values are reversed. So you see that the student guesses about the program by just tracing a concrete example and making the wrong conclusion because we know that it sorts rather than reverses the uh, the value. So we know a bit more now how students develop when they learn how to program and we can make use of this. So these are a few applications of that uh, of that insight. So if we know that reason that reading and explaining is so difficult is is so is so important then we should pay attention to that in class and lectures. And one of the, uh, the the main strategies for teaching how to program nowadays in schools is to use the so-called use, modify, create. You first let students use an existing code to understand that existing code and to read it. Then we ask them to modify. That means that you make a small, a small 
alter, uh, uh, alterations, small small modif modifications. You change the code a bit, and then we ask them to to create something new, to code something uh, something new, a new program. And that's really a nice development. And there is also a variant for, especially for young children, uh, which is called PRIM, predict, run, investigate, modify, and make, uh, which is very successful in teaching, especially young children how to program. Uh, also, thinking before coding is very important. So looking at code, reasoning about code, and, and, and uh, um, uh, designing a solution before typing typing in the code and what is absolutely not encouraged is trial and error so write a program and then if it doesn't work make small uh, small changes and then try again this is trial and error and very unsystematic and it's discouraged so people uh, are uh, not encouraged to do that, and um, uh, try on error is bad programming behavior. So we know a bit more about how students, how programming students uh, develop and how to support that. And that is also what uh, my group does in some research. So uh, this is a, a paper that was published recently, one of uh, uh, my PhD students did some research in recognizing uh, difficulties in uh, uh, beginning programmers and how to support them the development. And that really helps to uh, also to support teachers to understanding uh, the difficulties of their students. This type of research I do together with uh, the Institute for Computer Science and um, that is a nice institute uh, neighbors in my uh, in my uh, my working space um, the computing and information sciences institute uh, uh, has three departments department on software science uh, data science including artificial intelligence and also a nice department on digital security uh, with bachelor programs in computer science and information sciences with uh, lots of international students. So uh, very recommended uh, at least to get in touch or maybe do maybe an exchange or something like that. Um, so we collaborate a lot with this uh, nice uh, Computer Science Institute. And one of the collaborations is, I think, a nice example um, about how to support reading, because we know that that reading is being able to read programs is an important skill. So how can we support reading of programs? And one of the things that you always see in, in program environments is highlighting. So parts of the code are highlighted to, to distinguish keywords and to help the programmer read the code. And we have here two types of, of highlighting, uh, colors that is often used, and another type of highlighting, the second part, that uh, highlights structures, so blocks of structures, uh, name, uh, for instance, for loops or, or, or while loops or, um, or other procedures. So it highlights structures, not keywords. And we wondered what would help beginning programmers to read code and to understand code. And what we did was this is research together with the University of Amsterdam, and um, we used eye trackers, and that was very nice. We studied how people read code with an eye tracker, so how uh, where their eyes focus on in these conditions. So no highlighting, this color highlighting, so the, 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 the uh, keyword highlighting, and this block highlighting. And we studied how people behave and how people read. And what was very interesting, this is a, uh, a gaze pattern. You see on the vertical axis, you see the program text. And on the horizontal axis, you see the time. And uh, the little blocks, the little gray blocks, are the, uh, the, the, the statement uh, on which the students have their eyes, so where they look at. 
And you see quite a difference here. The rightmost pictures are the situation in block highlighting, so the second form of highlighting, and the left is another form, either no highlighting or, or uh, um, um, keyword highlighting. And what we see is that the reading is a lot easier in the rightmost condition. And there's a lot of going back and forth with the eyes in the leftmost condition. So this was quite a discovery that it really helps students to read code, this uh, block highlighting. And the uh, um, surprising fact was that the students were not, were not aware of that themselves. They thought it made no difference. So in the interviews uh, that we also held with the students, they said, no, it doesn't help. Well, it, 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 it makes no difference. But their eyes uh, said something completely different. The eyes uh, clearly revealed that uh, the block highlighting helped them read. So that was quite surprising that the students were not aware of this, uh, of this um, effect. So it's very nice research, I think, uh, what happens when students read programs and write programs. So we know a bit of about compute, computational thinking and a bit of about programming. Let's move to the next subject uh, in this talk, namely what happens if you do AI, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So how does it change the picture? And I have here a characterization. So what happens if you add artificial intelligence? So in the old sense, uh, a program does something with input. You uh, give it some input and it gives some output. And in the traditional way, all the knowledge that is needed to make the output is in the program. So you can open it and read it and see what it does. In the new situation with AI, it's a bit, I simplify a bit, but it is a bit more difficult because not only you have a program, but the program generates a model, a model in which the knowledge is stored. So the program itself, it's just generic. There's nothing special, it remains the same, but the, the knowledge that you get from different inputs, different data is stored in this model. And this is typical machine learning. So the, the machine learns and all the knowledge is stored in the model. So if you open an AI program, then you will not, say, not see the knowledge that is needed to transform input to output. The knowledge is not there. The knowledge is in this model, which is not e uh, easily visible. So that means a lot to, um, to, to programming and teaching programming, because we knew that in the old situation, it makes sense. You have to teach people to read the program, so to open a program and then to see how it works. Well, in an AI program, this doesn't make sense because the only thing that is programmed there is the learning of the, of the, uh, of the computer and the real knowledge is in this model. So opening a program and reading it doesn't help anymore to understand how a solution works. You have to know which data has been, has been done and how the learning works, but the knowledge itself is not longer in this program. So that means that this result that first students should be able to read programs is not longer useful anymore. You cannot, you cannot base your programming on that. You have to do something else. You have to experiment with data, with different, different inputs, and you have to try something and then adjust a bit if it doesn't give the right results. But this was exactly what was discouraged in, uh, um, in the old situation without AI. Trial and error is wrong. You should think and make a systematic program uh, uh, and then uh, it's okay. But trial and error, just trying something and then seeing what it does, 
is not the right way. But in art, in an AI setting, it is the right way. You have to experiment. You have to experiment with different inputs. Cannot uh, experiment with a program anymore because the program is the same for all applications. So what you get now in this new situation is that you experiment with data. And uh, that is a completely new world. So you don't have to open a program to see how it works. You just experiment with different inputs. And these are children, young children. So they, it's, it's very easy to do for young people. Uh, these young children, they train a, uh, uh, an algorithm uh, uh, for, for gesture recognition. So these hand gestures, they uh, uh, are recognized. So they they have an existing uh, program that, it, that, that learns so that they don't have to change it. And they train this uh, thing, so they build up a model uh, using different examples. So they make gestures in front of the camera and they train the, uh, the, uh, the algorithm. And so uh, the computer makes a model of, out of this. So it's a completely different way of working. And you have to experiment, you have to trial and error. Uh, and um, so uh, it is encouraged to just to experiment to try out things. And um, well, that means a lot to the way we teach. Because all these things that we know, we can just, well, trash more or less, because they don't longer work in this situation. And uh, that's why some people say, and I, I, I like this uh, this view a lot, that we have to upgrade computational thinking. And uh, these authors, uh, uh, Mati Tedre and others, they say that we should go from computational thinking 1.0 to 2.0 uh, with AI, and it changes everything. So you see in the red things, uh, uh, experimenting is important. Um, um, you cannot look anymore to the structure of the program because it's no longer visible. So you can visualize in 1.0, but you cannot visualize this in uh, in 2.0. You cannot open a program and see how it works. Um, and trial and error is discouraged in 1.0, but necessary, absolutely necessary to do in 2.0. And that's that's really an, an interesting development. And now we're trying to find out how to do that. Well, um, there are some nice developments. Uh, Chat GPT is one of, uh, is an example of uh, what we call a um, large language model. So it's, it's trained to, uh, to predict linguistic things. And um, you can use it a lot for, um, for, for questions and problems that have a, a language uh, text-based uh, uh, solution. And I've been using it as well. Uh, so I've been using ChatGPT to make the, uh, 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 the summary of this lecture and also my biography. So the information that you got in the announcement uh, well, I wrote a version myself, um, and I asked ChatGPT to improve. Uh, it was a very nice uh, experience. So I had I typed a bit about myself and said, well, "Can you improve that?" And uh, this AI tool said, "Okay, of course I can improve it." And then I got something that maybe my mother would like to read, but uh, it was very over the top. It was very exaggerated, and then. So this is a trial and error. You can experiment a bit. This is okay, make it a bit different. So I forgot to tell you that it should be a bit modest. And then I got a new version. And uh, well, I got an email from uh, Professor Sosa Panta that I should have my bio in uh, not more than 60 words. And of course I asked ChatGPT to help me. So I said, can you, uh, can you summarize this bio in less than 60 words? And of course it does it. 
You have to check all these things because sometimes ChatGPT makes mistakes, and uh, some some people say it hallucinates, it, it gets wrong information. But still, it's a very powerful tool. So now people have been thinking how to use these AI artificial intelligence tools to program in the traditional way. So not experiment with data, but program using this AI tool. So make a conventional program and traditional program uh, entirely written uh, by chat GPT. And so use AI, but the result is not a model, but the result is a real program in the traditional sense. And there is a nice movie, and I can recommend it to you to um, uh, to watch that movie. Um, it is an experiment in how to use the ChatGPT for writing programs. And uh, it's a very nice example. It is a, a game, a video game, a very in, a s small but interesting, funny uh, video game. And um, um, you have to instruct ChatGPT what kind of program you, will t you want to have. So this prompting is very important. And gradually you learn what are the right instructions for this AI tool to generate a program. So you ask to generate a program and then you test it. Um, you see whether it does what you expect. And in this case, there were a few problems, but trial and error is OK, right? So you, uh, the, the author of this, of this video, and it's very funny to see, um, uh, discovered a few things that went wrong. And he asked ChatGPT to correct them. So one mistake was that the, uh, this is a bird flying. And the bird went out of view, uh, so the camera was not following. And that was his mistake, so the programmer's mistake, because it was not in the instructions for ChatGPT. So it was forgotten in the, it was not, not in the program. So he said, can you add this feature that the camera follows the bird? There were other errors that um, uh, came into view. And one was a human error, so an error not in the prompt, but just an error that the programmer had put the code on the right, in the wrong positions. So there's a human mistake that came up in this process. And, and that is why we should warn also a bit that there were some mistakes made by the tool, made by ChatGPT, programming mistakes that were only discovered by running and expecting the code. So it's still that is an important, an important skill. And uh, um, well, people who have used ChatGPT before, they know a bit how it works. You point at an error and ChatGPT says, oh yes, you're completely right, I apologize. And this is an improved solution. And it's a very fascinating movie in which without any programming by the programmer, himself, uh, everything was generated by this AI tool. And it's really an impressive, impressive example. So I would like to know how to teach this to students, because I think that this is, it's not something to be afraid of. Uh, and uh, uh, it would be very nice to actually use ChatGPT, these things in, uh, um, in programming. Um, uh, and and to collaborate with uh, a tool like that. So it is a new skill, it's a new way of working, and I think uh, it is very worthwhile to to study how that how that goes and and teach it to students. So students should not be forbidden to use it. I think students uh, should make use of it, but in the right way. So. Uh, this is very nice. Some people are afraid of it, I already said. Especially teachers are afraid of this because they are afraid that their students will uh, do their exercises using ChatGPT. Well, that might be um, 
a danger, uh, but also this tool can help teachers. And this is a nice result uh, published last year in which uh, researchers uh, investigated uh, how ChatGPT or another large language model can help teachers generate exercises, generate interesting exercises um, for their students and also help giving feedback to students. So it's a very nice application in which, well, maybe it has some, a bit of dis some disadvantages, these tools, but I got some There's a, a message there. That's right, Eric. We are listening to you and we're watching. OK, good. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, we go towards the end of the uh, of the lecture. So um, uh, I'm happy that uh, I to see the keep you keeping it uh, almost within one hour. Um, so uh, these are all nice developments. So what do we do? I, I already told you what kind of research I do, and uh, I want to help developing uh, uh, programming and programming education in this new uh, these new times, and I want to improve how uh, students, um, uh, STEM students, engineering students, uh, 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 learn how to program and how they use these tools. Um, and a bit of an outlook what uh, 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 what our institute is doing. Um, so we want to look at STEM education of the future and using AI is only one example. Um, another thing is that uh, uh, students uh, should be able to take action. Our world is changing. There is the energy trans transition, there's pollution, there's climate change. And um, uh, I think especially STEM students can help um, um, uh, play a role in, in, in solving uh, these, uh, these challenges. So we have a nice project together with the uh, University of Applied Sciences in Arnhem and Nijmegen um, to see what kind of new engineering skills are needed and how we can support these skills using AI, but also using other types of, of education. So this is a very exciting project. So education should transform students and help I think something went wrong. Uh, am I back? You've got some delay with the connection, but that ah, was yes, I see. don't worry. OK, OK, so that's fine. Yeah, sure. So uh, it, it, it's called transformative science education and we are uh, helping helping to, uh, to uh, accomplish that. And I already said new computational thinking and new programming in times of AI, that's really a challenge and we are helping and, and investigating how to do that. It's very exciting. Um, and I was, uh, I'm happy that I could share some of the ideas with you. Um, I have my contact info here. So uh, you're very welcome to contact me uh, for any help or maybe information about studying in the Netherlands. I um, uh, will be glad to help. Uh, also, we are looking for collaborations with institutes and students and teachers. Uh, so it will be very nice to, uh, to connect. Um, and so feel free to, uh, to contact me uh, later on. So I think that is the end of my lecture.
Uh, I will stop okay. sharing my screen and I will be very happy to take any questions. Okay, Eric, thank you very much for your lecture. It was very great uh, for us. So uh, at this moment, one of our students is going to read some of the questions uh, of the other students. So uh, Jennifer, you can start right now if you want. Profe, ¿me escuchas? Sí, sí se escucha. Eh, ya se está viendo, sí. Sí, ok. So, I, in, okay. I introduce you. Eh, so, Eric, she's Jennifer. She's one of our students in Pascual Bravo. And Jennifer, he is Eric, the lecturer uh, of today in the Catera Nomada. Nice to meet you. Okay. Uh, hello, Mr. Eric. I am Jennifer Escudero, an electrical engineering student uh, at the Pascual Bravo University Institution. Uh, and I am going to be the person in charge uh, of us asking uh, you the question that my classmates have about the talk. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Okay, the first question is asked by comrade David Mejia uh, is, uh, what are the most effective and accessible resources uh, for those interested in learning to code in the context of AI? And how can this resource help you develop prevalent and applicable skills in the file of AI? So, uh, um, effective resources to help, uh, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, the question is, uh, what are resources to help to learn how to program in, in AI? Um, well, I don't know by heart, but there, the, the paper that I mentioned, and there, there will be a recording right in this uh, 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 of this session. The paper I mentioned by Tedre and others, they have references to, uh, to these things. So I think you can distinguish um, uh, two main uh, forms of this education. So one is um, uh, training machine learning applications so the, the the stuff that you that you saw the children do um uh, i think there's that is uh, uh, we already know a lot more about how to teach that and how to learn that so there will be separate resources there i think what we uh, still are exploring are uh, is how to how to collaborate, like I showed um, with developing that uh, that video game. So co-developing a programmer together with an AI tool, I think we're still developing, uh, still uh, yeah, developing our understanding. So I expect that there will not be uh, many resources there uh, yet. But uh, I can uh, I can investigate a bit further and look up if I can I can find some resources and I can uh, uh, definitely um, get in touch back um, uh, on on this matter. So yes, there are resources, but uh, uh, on a limited uh, uh, part of AI programming. I hope that answers the questions at least partially. Uh, okay. Uh, the question is asked by comrade Steven Zapata is what are the difference between supervised learning and unsupervised um, learning at the programming level in machine learning. 
I think that is a technical question about machine learning and not, I, I, I understand supervised learning is learning in the machine learning sense, not in the human learning sense. So, and I'm not an AI specialist in uh, in machine learning. Um, so I think I cannot answer that question that uh, that question at the moment. Okay, Eric, do not worry. Uh, let's continue. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Jennifer. Okay, uh, the question is asked uh, by Conrad Fernando Montoya. What do you think are the most important challenge? Uh, we face disculpensky. We. Oui. There was some noise yeah, on the line. Yeah, yeah, she she got some noise. Don't yeah. worry, Jennifer. Uh, okay, what do you think? Are, uh, what do you think are the most important challenge uh, we face as we navigate navigate the artificial intelligence uh, revolution, and how can we address uh, them ethically and responsibly? Oh, that's a very interesting question indeed. Um, so, uh, um, I think, uh, so there's, uh, uh, I see a few challenges. Uh, um, first is, um, if you look at uh, AI um, uh, applications from the point of view of programming and, 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 um, and quality of, of software, uh, I think that uh, um, it is difficult to assess the quality of what you get. So, for instance, uh, um, uh, if you if you make a program um, together with an AI application, there will be mistakes, there will be uncertainties, and what students uh, the, the, the students' tendency is to just to test. A few uh, examples, and then see, uh, and then and then check if the program uh, does what it what it needs to do. But of course, a few test uh, cases are usually not enough. So to assess, so to get an idea about the quality of what you do, that is a challenge. So, and I think it holds for both the uh, real AI uh, machine learning. So how do you deal with the data? What is good data to train your model with? That is a challenge. And in the collaboration sense, like developing a program together with AI, how do you assess that the program you get is, is, is good? Uh, because you cannot trust all of the AI, but how do you assess? So that is a big, big uh, challenge. The, 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 um, um, the, um, uh, assessment of, of the quality. Another uh, big issue is, I think, the awareness of people uh, about the impact of these algorithms. And, and if you if you look at so the second uh, type of programs, so the learning programs, um, they depend a lot on the quality of the data. Uh, and uh, many people are not aware of the bias that uh, that comes with these things. So what I see as my responsibility as well is teaching young people about the, the bias that can be introduced by data. And there are lots of examples and, and the most painful examples stem from, uh, um, for instance, criminal uh, algorithms, uh, um, uh, algorithms uh, determining how um, um, uh, uh, which people to check, for instance, and which people to investigate in a criminal investigation. And uh, lots of these algorithms have a bias for color, for, for race. 
and that's very painful because they they were trained in the wrong way. Uh, so I think awareness of this, of the uh, data bias and the uh, um, uh, the bias of these algorithms is, is very important. So uh, speaking about ethics, so how uh, these things can be uh, used in an ethical way is very important. And so we should not only teach uh, young people how to program, but also uh, showing them uh, insight in the ethical uh, complicate, uh, complications. So I see both the technical points, so uh, um, insight in quality, but also uh, ethical points, namely uh, awareness of bias that you get. Okay, um, the next questions uh, from Ray, Juan Camilo Guerrero. What do you think will be the most significant impact of AI in the manufacturing industry in the coming years? Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, there will be lots of impact. Uh, uh, I think. Uh, especially on the on the meta level we can we can use a we automate lots of manufacturing uh, things like uh, I mean, the classical example is manufacturing cars by robots um, so th this is quite common and 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 will will um, will increase uh, even but i think uh, the impact of AI there is that uh, these applications will be able to improve themselves and learn. And I, I uh, remember an interesting project uh, that uh, members of the Computer Science Institute in my uh, in my environment uh, uh, did, and they um, it was uh, in the context of printers. Uh, so. You know that the printer is very physical, so it is a kind of interface between digital and, and physical things. And sometimes things uh, uh, get wrong because uh, uh, these rolls that, that carry the paper, they get stuck or they get old or they so the friction changes a bit. So uh, it changes over time. And uh, the idea was to learn how this changes over time so that the machine can adjust itself. And I think AI is is an excellent way of of improve incorporating kind of self improvement. So not only automate things, but in incorporate kind of improving things. So uh, algorithms that improve and and um, um, uh, and and um, change the way uh, this manufacturing is done. So learning manufacturing systems, I think that is a very nice impact and I expect a lot from, from AI applications there. Um, and for the rest, I think on the design level, so before the manufacturing, I think designing things is completely different uh, than before. So designing using AI and making extrapolations and uh, getting new ideas and um, doing simulations, uh, well, not astrophysical simulations, but simulations of the products that you want to make, I think will be uh, will be the future. So before the manufacturing will be a lot of changes, but manufacturing itself, automating this will also change, I think. Thanks. OK, Eric. Thank you. Eh, Jennifer, también muchísimas gracias por tus preguntas y por tu participación. Y enseguida le vamos a dar paso a Daniel, que también quiere hacer unas preguntas. Vale. So, Eric, we have here some other uh, student which is interested uh, in talking uh, with you. So, okay, Daniel, great. Uh, I Welcome. introduce you also. Uh, Daniel is Eric, the lecturer 
el, el, el presentador de el conferencista del día de hoy eh, so Eric he's Daniel one of our students entonces Daniel si quieres por favor te presentas con Eric vale y le haces tu pregunta okay. eh, hi Mr Eric eh, um, I am Daniel Daniel Andrés Restrepo Castrillón eh, I am a student from from the Pascual Bravo and my question my question is what, what what do you think about the implementation school computational thinking program program from the from from shieldhood ah this is very uh, so the question is uh, um, how to implement computational thinking starting in childhood right right okay uh, yeah so uh, it was thought for a long time that we should postpone uh, these things so young children should not be able to uh, cannot do this and maybe you start in high school if if children are uh, 12 years old or so and maybe you start a bit there nowadays we see that the programming environments that uh, uh, people can use are very user friendly When I learned how to program, we had to type texts and keywords, and it was very textual. And uh, nowadays, children learn block-based programming with Scratch or so, and they click a program together. So programming has become easier and more user-friendly. And we see, at least in my country, that uh, especially uh, lower classes in high school, but also in primary school, Uh, uh, children learn how to program. Well, I hope I made clear that computational thinking is not only programming, but also using other uh, digital technology. And I think uh, uh, these um, um, simple programs, uh, they're excellent for uh, for young children. And also, um, Also, uh, using existing tools, you can do it in early ages. So I think in primary school, you can already start. And I think this development of AI uh, even helps. So you saw some very young children in these pictures and uh, 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 training this, uh, this AI model. And, um, Uh, and that shows that even very young children can experience AI and, and, and work with that. So I think you can start in an early stage. And I think it's very important also to make students, make children familiar. Also with the, the other side of, of programming and, and computer science, namely ethical things and, uh, and, and the consequences. So I think it's it's it really helps to uh, to teach them. Um, I think there's another uh, uh, factor, and especially in my part of Europe, so in the north of Europe, we have a big gender uh, bias. So uh, people who do do engineering studies or um, uh, exact sciences like like computer science are mostly boys. And uh, and we do a lot to change that. So in the south of Europe, it's completely different. So it's a bit 50-50. So I think also uh, uh, showing children, young children, how this, these things work and, and that it can be fun to do is also important. So that's another reason to start early, because we know that at the age of 11, 12, people get biased by their environment. And, and there's a lot of prejudice, like this is not for girls. And I think before that age, uh, you can still, uh, children are less influenced by, uh, by, by, by this pressure. So I think also for that reason, it's, it's, it's important to start early. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah it's a score. So we do a lot of work together with schools to to see how this can be done, and uh, I, and it's really nice to see uh, 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 teachers of of primary schools uh, with their with their uh, pupils to uh, to experiment with robots, with computational thinking, and with programming. Yeah, so it's really fun to do. 
Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Daniel. Uh, thank you, Eric, very much. So we have a, a teacher from some other university which is interested in asking you their yeah. question. So, Maria, you can start right now. Okay, thank you. Hi. Hello, Maria. Hi. Uh, first, my apologize for my pronunciation, okay? <laughs> it's not good, but I have a question for you. Well, your English uh, is much better than my Spanish, so uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's really good, fine. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, how can we identify computational thinking skills in individuals before they start their university careers? Uh, so that they don't drop out the higher education. Oh, this is uh, uh, very interesting. Um, so, uh, if I understand correctly, so how can we foster computational thinking so people don't drop out when they do higher education studies? Yeah. So, um, um, Yeah, I think there, there are uh, a few sides. Uh, first, I think that uh, in higher education, you see lots of applications of programming, for instance, and, and, and computers. Every field has changed, not only astrophysics, but all, every field has changed. So uh, the, that impact you can uh, you can translate to uh, to high school uh, uh, and even to primary education. So what we see in uh, using the computer in physics, in mathematics, in, in whatever, you can already translate, you can already show in high school. And I think this integration is, is very important. So as I said, Peppert th thought that you don't have to integrate, you just learn and teach them how to program and they will do it. It doesn't happen. So I think that is the cause also of, of many dropouts that you that there's a mismatch between what we teach the students and what we expect from them. So you really have to teach the integration. You have to teach within physics class or within the mathematics class how to use the computer. Uh, so that's one. And I think uh, the other aspect is uh, what I just discussed um, um, uh, that you start, should start early, and and that it is it should be it should not be uh, special to use the computer in in class. But there's a problem there because if you want to integrate computational thinking and programming in uh, in secondary education, so high school or primary education, you have to. You have to have teachers who are also uh, who know how to do this, and that is a big problem uh, um, in in most countries that uh, uh, many teachers don't know how to do it, uh, but they're eager to learn. So it's not it's uh, I don't blame them <laughs> because they have never learned how to do it, uh, and they they are interested in in doing this in their classes, but they have to learn this. So I think that's that's also a bottleneck. Uh, we have to educate the teachers. So one of our projects that I was talking about was uh, to incorporate computational thinking and programming in teacher education. So uh, to uh, to teach the teachers how to do it, but also how to support their students in learning that. So. Uh, so two things, integration is important. You, a separate subject, computer science. Yeah, it is nice, but if you don't integrate it in other subjects, it won't work. Uh, and you have to educate the teachers. And that is a bottleneck. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. Muchas gracias, Maria. Thank you, Eric. So, Eric, we have so many questions. Uh, so if if you want, uh, I can send them to you via email. 
Oh, and that's if it's very not nice. Yes. The problem for you. You can answer them. Yes, later. that's great. Yes. Don't worry about that. Yeah. So oh, that is very uh, nice, and I'm I'm very Eric, pleased that uh, I, that so many uh, reactions are there. That's very okay. nice. Okay. Thanks. So, Eric, uh, I I have a question for you. Uh, this could be the final question today, mm -hmm. uh, which is concerned uh, taking advantage of the images and simulations you presented, uh, which were created from Leon. Uh, so, um, and, and the question is, what do you think could be the role of artificial intelligence could play in the following years in order to understand the world and the universe behavior and development? So, uh, do you know physics is a natural and fundamental theory, but uh, artificial intelligence could help in order to understand the universe mysteries? Yeah, that is a, a very interesting question. Thank you. Um, because uh, AI uh, and especially machine learning uh, can be used to discover patterns, right? So patterns in unordered uh, data, um, but you have to train uh, that. So, uh, but at the same time, we know that there is an order, or at least I believe there is an order, namely the laws of physics. <laughs> uh, so, but letting letting AI discover the laws of physics is maybe not not feasible, but to discover patterns that were not immediately possible, immediately apparent in data in unordered data. So, these huge amounts of data. I think there is a thing that that uh, AI can help explore. So inventing the laws of physics, maybe not, but explore data and explore uh, um, patterns, I think is a very nice uh, nice thing in AI and I, uh, in, 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 in this, this applied physics. Then I already see this in, in my own research. So I do research not only in, in Computer science, but but also in this learning and teaching, and and what what happens to to students when they learn these things. So I have a lot of qualitative data, uh, interviews of students, or maybe conversations of students collaborating on a programming exercise, and I see that uh, an analyzing these things, that uh, it was tedious, was done by hand uh, uh, usually. And AI also helps us to Im to discover patterns that we would have not seen before in this qualitative data. So I think both in this hard quantitative data of the simulations and the 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 the, the astrophysics, but also in quali qualitative data, AI can help us explore and and discover things. And maybe it's a hunch. Uh, maybe it's not true. But if a if an AI application says you should look at this because there might be a correlation or there might be a pattern, then you can investigate and then maybe you say, oh no no, I know what how to explain this. This is just an artifact. It is just human behavior or human uh, things. Uh, then it's it's okay. But you can uh, the AI can spot interesting things to discover. So, and I think that's both true for uh, um, for astrophysics, uh, but also for uh, for teaching and learning. So it should Thank help. You. Yeah, it should help the uh, investigator. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, so much uh, to do. <laughs> definitely. So, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, bueno, para los participantes de la cátedra, recuerden que. El próximo miércoles 31 de mayo tenemos la última charla denominada Internet de las Cosas. Y ya con eso terminaríamos pues nuestro ciclo de conferencias de este primer semestre del 2023. So, Eric, uh, thank you very much again. And... Uh, It was um, a great pleasure. Thank yeah. you for organizing, for organizing and for inviting me. Just, just to finalize, could you please send our motivated students um, motivational message in order to continue studying uh, those topics related to, with computer science and some others. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. See you, Eric. Thank you. My pleasure. And uh, yeah, if there's anything I can do or or uh, uh, follow up, then uh, then let me know. Of course, Eric. Thank you. That's all for now. Bye bye. Bye. See ya. Yes, hasta luego. It's a pleasure meeting you, Maria. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So I think I can disconnect. So if, if there's anything, just get in touch with me, okay? Yeah, you can you can disconnect now. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Bye bye. Have a nice yeah. day.